So now uh, let me invite Dr. Sastri for his talk on uh, stent of various type of stent, their evolution type, and influence on the PCI outcome. Dr. Uh, B.K. Sastri, please. Pendra, which one, one second. Good evening, everyone. Uh, before I actually get to, I, I, first I would like to thank uh, Srinivas Kumar uh, for inviting me. I am an odd man out here. Uh, you know, the reason is I would like to call myself a general cardiologist than interventional cardiologist. I think being a general cardiologist is more difficult and challenging nowadays with the advancement of the technology and uh, hardware, the interventions are, I don't say easy, but uh, they are quite a lot different from what they used to be a couple of decades back. Probably I'm, I suppose I'm the senior most here, so I can take that uh, point. Now, I don't know, they're struggling with my pen drive, I have, though I gave it much before. Uh, one one quick point about uh, the wires, a couple of points. Uh, most of you people sitting here would probably be using gas or G wires, so-called Oxford wires or gas wires. Uh, Shukumar said his preferential wire is uh, Vishpur. Uh, I will be hesitant to do that, especially to tell you the juniors, freshers. Uh, Vishpur, especially if you use uh, you make sure in the initial days that uh, some senior is there with you and make sure that always keep the eye on the distal. It has a tendency for perforation. And most importantly, a gassed whisper wire loses its coating. It loses its coating. All the wires lose their coating. So they are not like what the new wires are. They tend to be sticky. Balloon gets stuck to the wire. When you pull the wire, balloon, the wire also comes out many times. In my institute, we don't use any Oxford uh, wires. And uh, as he said very rightly, never use an Oxford whisper because a coating will go away and it will struck. And in fact, it, this whole movement will be very difficult. So if you are using an Oxford, I would say don't go to the whisper. Whisper is only a new wire has to be there all the time. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I think I'll move with my talk. The, the history is very important to understand the evolution of the stents. Evolution is after all history. The first angioplasty, plain balloon angioplasty was done by Grunzig in 1977. He's a Swiss uh, international cardiologist. Unfortunately, he died premature. And that is a great milestone in the practice of cardiology. He did only plain balloon angioplasty in a proximal LED lesion, and the patient did remarkably well. Uh, thankful to him, there's no acute dissection or thrombosis, and uh, it caught the attention of the international cardiologist. But uh, plain balloon angioplasty is uh, problematic because there can be acute vessel dissection or acute thrombosis. And the days when we were doing plain balloon angioplasty, the surgeon used to be on standby. I remember one of my relatives asked me to recommend to Dr. Somraju to get the procedure expedited for uh, RCA, type A, balloon angioplasty. That is in 1989 when I was doing my DM in Chandigarh. I came home to Hyderabad and my relative said, please ask Dr. Somraju to do it fast. Why? He has been waiting for three days and all the three days for a RCA, plain balloon angioplasty, patient's blood group was O negative and six donors were standby. Six donors standby O negative group for plain balloon angioplasty of RCA. You know, when suddenly patient requires surgery, anything can go wrong. This is an era where stents are not there. So, the two main problems with the plain balloon angioplasty are the dissection, sometimes which can be very nasty, closure, or acute thrombus formation, and sometimes you have to send the patient for surgery. So, to bail out, the bailout stents have come, the 
Jian uh, Turco stents and uh, Victor stents. And later on, 1984, Sigvot has started a self-expanding stent, which is a plain metal tube. It is very difficult to negotiate the plain metal tube through the tortuous arteries. Then, later on in 1987, the balloon expandable stents have come. The Jain J. Pama stent. Uh, that is, I think it's about uh, 94, yes, 94. Then, the Ben stent and uh, stress, they are the two studies which compared the bare metal stents with the POBA and demonstrated superiority. I think that if I remember well, the Ben stent retinal state was 16%, but later on it became 32% because more and more type B, type C1, type C illusions were st they started doing. Then we realized that the brain, bare metal stent is the problem is the you tackle the acute dissection and acute thrombosis, but you are stuck with retinosis. And to prevent retinosis, 1999, Cypher stent was first used. And in 2002, the cypher data has come. You know what cypher means? Zero. The first cypher stent, degluting de de stent, the retinosis rate at six months is zero. Cypher means zero. And cypher, that is a synonymous stent, then simultaneously very soon, excuse me, paclodaxel stent has come. Both were shown remarkable chance of retinosis. Then what happened? In 2006, uh, European Society of Cardiology, um, this is a big uh, warning, big commotion, because very late stent thrombosis was there. Even the Times magazine said walking time bombs, because the people with cipher stents may have stent thrombosis any times. So this is actually a big uh, commotion in the in the in the general news media also, and people studied it and they modified the degrading stents. And today you have got uh, various uh, safe stents. As I mentioned, the main problem with the bare metal stent is the instant retinosis, which can be there in 20 to 30 percent of the patients. So, what does the stent contain? The basically stent in the center has a stent platform, which can be cobalt chromium, platinum chromium, or stainless steel. That is covered by polymer. Uh, various kinds of polymers are there. I am not going into detail. And anti-proliferative drugs to inhibit the smooth muscle endothelial cell proliferation. There are, they have been tried many, but the main today what we are using are sirolimus, everolimus, biolimus, and uh, uh, jetrolimus. They are the four most commonly used. Now, as I mentioned, uh, the drug irritating strands versus bare metal strand data, you can see both in the serious study, taxa study, and endeavor study, the retinosis rates are much less. And as I mentioned, the basket late study raised alarm that the late stent thrombosis is very high. If it occurs within the 24 hours stent thrombosis, it is said to be almost always operator dependent. That is acute stent thrombosis. Within one to one month is subacute thrombosis. One month to six months is late thrombosis. And after one year is very late thrombosis. So very late thrombosis can occur with first generation drug eluting stents. Uh, this is a busy slide. This is a representative of so many, I mean, we have got so many strands in the market. This is a representative of the various strands. Uh, you have got um, uh, Biozon SARS, um, the BioFreedom, the R0, Promier, Resolute, Synergy, Ultimaster, Zines, you know, various parameters, some of them which I will go into it. And you should also know about the Indian strands, the strands manufactured in India. There are three main companies. There may be more. I think there are definitely more than three. Uh, for representative purpose, I have taken three, the Sahajanand and SMT, Relisys and Merrill. The stent characteristics, if you see the physical properties, they are no less than the so-called uh, imported foreign or uh, branded uh, stents. You, you should go into these details, minor details, to understand what they are. So what is the composition? The composition can be stainless or iron platinum, cobalt chromium, chrom chromium L605, Cobalt chromium L605, there are various metal alloys. The composition varies depending on the strand platform. Now, what is the main purpose of this? They provide the radial strength. They give the opacity. You can see the strand there. They prevent the recoil. But they're also prone for stress fractures and thrombosis. The first three are important, safety and efficacy. The last two are the safety points. And the bare metal strands, the, the strength platform, as well as the way it is made, 
physical properties are also important because in the very early studies you see the various stents, depending on their structure, platform, the retinosis rates vary quite widely. So what does the stent contain? You obviously look at the cell length. There are so many cells are there. You see the cell length. What is the crests per ring? What are the kind of links are there? What is the stent made up of? And what is the thickness and width of the strut? So all these things are important biophysical properties which decide whether what is the, the cell uh, size, what is the radial strength, what is its tendency for longitudinal strength deformation, what is the obesity, all these things matter. So this basic information, you, you be familiar with, as uh, Sivakumar or others were saying, you be familiar with few stands and know their uh, characters thoroughly. And the links are also important because you can see links can be in phase or out of phase or mid strut connectors or offset peak to peak, various kinds of designs you can have. As you can see, where is the laser? This is the, this is the one. Yeah, as you see, the strength of the longitudinal strength increases towards this, whereas it becomes weaker as it goes to the right side. And radial strength of different regulating strands uh, changes. For example, here some sample is there, Zion, Synergy, or Zero, and Resolute. They, they, depending on the characteristics I said, the radial strength changes. And what is longitudinal integrity? The strength is uh, is a metal tube, isn't it? Thin metal tube. Uh, it can get deformed. <laughs> it can get deformed. Either when are pulling or pushing. Suppose the stent is in the very in the left main or the proximal LED, the guide catheter can get sucked inside and can deform the, the proximal portion of the stent. Uh, that is, uh, the, is commonly seen with the promus uh, stents and that led to a lot of problems. Similarly, once you have placed the stent, not necessarily there only, suppose you have placed the stent in the mid LED or mid RCA and you want to post dilatation, there is a guide wire bias or for whatever reason you are using a G balloon or whatever, the balloon doesn't go, it may go and hit the, the ostal portion of the stent and it may get deformed. Similarly, you have done a post dilatation or you are exchanging a wire or you are removing a balloon after the dilatation. If the strength of the longitudinal strength of the integrate of the uh, stent is not strong, it may get deformed while pulling. In the upper chamber, the push pressure and here the, they put a hook and saw how much uh, pressure is needed to deform the stent. So depending on the pressure that you use, either pushing or pulling, you can distort the stent and that will lead to problems. So we should know about the longitudinal stent uh, deformity. Then you, you have put a stent, you want to go into a side branch. Now the side branch should be accessible. Different stents have different cell sizes. So if the cell size is big, then it is easy for you to cross into the side branch. And not only side branch, if you want to do a later balloon dilatation of the side branch or a kissing balloon, you want to pass the balloon, it is important to know what is the cell design where the side branch is arising. So nowadays, some of the stents have got open cell in the center. So larger the cell, the, it is easy for you to pass the wire and uh, balloon subsequent to the this one. This is one of the, you can understand more clearly here. This is the cell size. Look at the cell size. It is so big. This particular five stands are of the same length and magnified to the same extent. So this gives you, this gives you an idea whether you have got a large side branch and you want to preserve it or cross it, you can't sacrifice it, then you should use a open cell design. Then the stent markers are there. Stent markers in the design stent and are very on the, at the very starting of the stent. Whereas in synergy, slightly delayed and onyx, slight gap is there. So you can see when you expand it, the design stent just expands where you are inflated, where the stent is there, marker is there. But in synergy and onyx, there is a small gap. This becomes very important when you precisely want to put a stent at the ostial lesions, ostium, uh, at the ostium of the uh, vessel. So you should, you should know what kind of stent you are using there. Now the strut thickness becomes an issue. The strut thickness in the early stents 
used to be more than 150 120 150 millisecond uh, millimeters uh, micron microns also but now we have got microns ultra thin struts about 60 to 80 uh, microns so does it matter whether what is the strut thickness it does matter why because if you have got a thicker strut um, it takes more time for the strut coverage to occur if strut coverage is de de uh, delayed there is a uncovered stent with fibrin formation and inflammation so the thicker strats take more time and they are prone for thrombosis. The same thing was shown in the meta-analysis of the many stents. The, here in this study, in this meta-analysis, r 0 me stent and biomime were studied and stent thrombosis is significantly less, though the driven, uh, dri uh, less, uh, uh, the TLR rates are uh, equal. The stent thrombosis is less in the ultra-thin stents. So, it's one of the useful points and also ultra thin strats will give you more flexibility more it, you can push the you can uh, position the strength uh, easily trackability is more but the radial strength will be less and there are various the important one of the important problems with the strength is the late strength fracture what are the factors which which are associated with the strength fracture rca strength stainless steel longer strengths hinge motion overlapping, stent vessel damp, this on multiple stents. So these are all various uh, factors which are, which influence the occurrence of stent fracture. In the bench testing, these integrity element and premier have at the even 10 million um, cycles, the stent fracture is less. This, this you can see in the graph here. So the late stent fracture is one important factor in the late stent thrombosis are uh, wrist gnosis. So, it's always a trade-off. If you've got a thick strut, you get a more radial strength. If you've got a thin strut, it is more flexible and uh, trackability is more. If you've got an open cell desi design, you can access the side branch. But if you've got an open cell design, the tissue prolapse will be more. So, here you can see there are the various characteristics. Some trade-off will be there. So, in a given patient, you have to select which one you want to choose. So what are the desirable features of a stent? It should be low profile to cross the lesion. Nowadays, it's not a difficult. Earlier, we used to have stents. It will be difficult to cross. If you prepare the bed very well, the, there should not be a problem in crossing with a stent. If you have a problem with the crossing with a stent, generally means you didn't prepare the bed well. It should be flexible through the, to, to go through the tortuous vessels. Should not get distorted or displaced. Enough longitudinal stent should be there. Radial stent should be there, especially if you're using for the osteal or calcific lesions. Excuse me. You should have uniform expansion. Side branch access should be there. Block Pro prolapse should not be there. And it conforms to the vessel curvature without vessel distortion at the edges. Otherwise, you may have vessel dissections or late strand fractures and should be enough radio opaque. Now, the second important component of the regulating strength is the polymer. I mentioned to you the cipher and taxa strands had serious problems with the very late strand thrombosis because the polymers used were some obsolete polymers, I can't even pronounce, polyethylene, covinyl, acetate, poly and butyl, blah, 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 blah. So these are all associated with, they are not biocompatible. They produce long inflammation. So patient was prone, there is no complete healing anytime. Patient were predisposed for thrombosis. The, so later stents now, nowadays, the, we use a polyfluorinated uh, polymers, which are highly biocompatible. They use phosphocholine, copolymer of polyvinylidene fluoride, and hexafluoropropylene. So these are the commonly stent used. Nowadays, except for the cipher and taxes, most of the present day stents, the polymer is biocompatible. And the polymer on the stent may not have uniform polymer coating. It may get webbed polymer surface leading to stent expansion issue or polymer may delaminate. So durable coating potential for inconsistent drug delivery, flaking and embolization. These are the problems if your polymer coating is not uniform. Now, people said, why keep the polymer? Why biocompatible? We will degrade it. So, you use a polymer which gets degraded. They typically use the poly PGLA that gets metabolized to carbon dioxide and water. So, after three to six months, the polymer just disappears. So, there is no problem with the polymer. Once the healing occurs, it is as good or as bad as a uh, bare metal stent after the healing process. So, there is no further risk gnosis there, but you got the result. But when they compared in a meta-analysis of nearly 84,000 stents, 
the so called bio absorbable polymers are not superior to bio uh, compatible polymers sorry bio yeah biodegradable polymers are not superior to uh, permanent polymers or bio bio uh, compatible polymers there is no difference in tvr there is no difference in cardiac death no difference in mi no difference in stent thrombosis and no difference in short or long stents now they said why polymer at all we do a polymer free stent and there is no polymer it compares better with the uh, this is because you know in high bleeding risk patients you don't want to give uh, anticoagulants for long time so remove the polymer uh, and give the short duration uh, anti, uh, anti dual antiplatelets it is superior to um, the bare metal stent but it is not superior to the bio compatible polymers the pool dot of different uh, polymers uh, uh, doesn't show any uh, difference in the in the efficacy endpoints and it does matter the um, the drug does matter everolimus or uh, sirolimus etc sometime back there is a discussion about the paclitaxel in the drug drug eluting strands sirolimus or everolimus strands are shown to be superior to paclitaxel drug coated strands nowadays we hardly get any drug coated strand with paclitaxel when it comes to drug coated balloon till today the data in randomized controlled trials for drug coated balloons is only the paclitaxel coated balloons the sirolimus coated balloons may be attractive but you don't have data be careful about using that uh, as far as the stents are concerned paclitaxel is inferior but we do not know about the drug coated balloons now what are the causes of the main problems with the drug coated uh, stents early and late inflammatory hypersensitivity reactions polymer irregularities that result in inconsistent drug regularity or nidus for thrombosis mechanical issues like strut fracture or longitudinal longitudinal deformation very late issues with permanent metallic implants like uh, vessel straightening and loss of cyclic strain vasomotion is not there and prone for neoatherosclerosis this has mentioned earlier in the bare metal stents in the first one year you see much better results with the drug coated stents first generation or second generation drug coated stents compared to the bare metal stents but after 12 years there is not much difference watch over the stent after the one year landmark analysis there is nearly 2% event rates per year so stents are not suitable in a long run with metallic stents persistent risk of stent thrombosis and need for antiplatelet agency that is a case that we want to avoid that you don't want stent fracture or late malposition prevent future cabg with complete metal jackets some of our international colleagues are very fond of converting every vessel into metal jacket do you any guess how many what are the number of maximum number of stents implanted in any human being on the earth any guess 54 54 stents there is one patient with 54 stents we don't want to do that that is crazy so when you convert the vessels into metal jackets at a later time you can't do a cabgs the side branch is compromised sometimes a complete occlusion or near total occlusion of a side branch from a instant restenosis is very difficult even for experienced operator to go and long term issues with two stents in bifurcation lesions iota osteal lesions concerned young patients issues with imaging you can't do a ct coronary angiogram concerned with endothelial function and vasomotion so all these reasons are long term determinants for the drug eluting stents so there is a promise of the bio resorbable stent in which there is a phase you know earlier you require support then the drug elution occurs very early up to 3 months then it gives support restoration of the vessel wall occurs the metal the the metal is not there the polymer is the metal here so that gets resorbed for a period of time the stent is resorbed and you are left with the open vessel here so it is like uh, probably drug coated balloon and uh, drug coated stents will compete with each other so with these ideas the, the abbot has come with bio absorb bbs it is a semi crystalline circumferential sinusoidal ring strut thickness is 150 microns because it is not a metal it doesn't have enough radial strength so this is a polymer to give that enough radial strength they have used 150 microns and because it is not radio opaque you require markers at each end and everolimus is the coated strand and the 
is the strength. The three year outcomes were not good. 2.3 versus 0.6 compared to the meta analysis of four BVS EAs or CTs. The, most of you would not have seen the one year results of your BVS. I'll tell you a problem there. This paper was published in NEJM. Most of the studies use the what we call non inferiority. The non inferiority margin for the first RCT for BBS is 4%. 4% is not acceptable. Be careful when the companies want to promote the products. The company knew that BBS is not going to do all along. I'm sorry to say this openly. They used a 4% inferiority margin and said it met the non inferiority margin and push the stent only to recall it back after a couple of years later. And you look, look here, the meta analysis of uh, three years target lesion failure, 11.2 and 8.1. The Abbott has to withdraw it from the market. Now, there is one point here. Suppose the landmark analysis at the end of three years, after three years, there is not further problem. So the first problem is only in the first three years. So what is the reason for that? Now, some of the international cardiologists who are, uh, I don't claim to be one, who are uh, very diehard international cardiologists, they say, if you use a proper technique of the BBS implantation, you get a better results. So what are these good techniques? PSP. What is PSP? Anybody? Huh? Wonderful. Pre-dilatation, sizing, and post-dilatation. So it's a bed preparation. You prepare the bed well, you take the appropriate size and do a proper post-dilatation. Imagine you see that uh, there is no under-expansion or malar position. Use the prolonged depth, use the thinner stretch, and improve the mechanical properties. Probably that will do better. So in this direction, surprisingly, our own Indian company was working on this. Mares 100, this is a Merrill company. From observe towards this, there is a change in the geometry, change in the strut thickness from 150 to 100. Crossing profile is decreased from 1.4 to 1.2 millimeters. More radio opaque markers. It is sometimes you have to struggle in the lab with BVS to position. And size matrix is more. You can have pick and choose many options. And storage conditions are more friendly. So this is the stent uh, diagram. You can see it in the on the net. Same thing was what I mentioned. Central open cell, closed cells at the ends, then um, all these uh, high visibility markers, etc. Now, we don't have a randomized control trial. We have only a uh, clinical evaluation trial in about 101 patients. 100, uh, uh, this is 108 patients. And they really only imaging this one. All quantitative, quantitative coronary angiography, OCT, IVA, CTA, everything was in favor, was very optimistic. Only one patient had mace in these patients. So how do you select the stents in a given patient? Younger patient, uh, probably in another couple of years down the line, we'll be using drug-coated balloons or biovascular scaffolds. We don't want to put a metal stent in the patient for long run. Elderly with high bleeding risk, you can choose a so-called polymer-free stent or even onyx stent is good enough. Some of these stents, Synergy also, you can get away with one month dual antiplatelets. <laughs> if you if you have a small vessel with less than 2.5 millimeters, you use the uh, ultra thin strands, uh, thin strands like uh, Orsiro or Onyx. Uh, if you've got osteolar calcific lesions, use a strand with um, good visibility and radial strength and less chance of longitudinal strand deformation. Uh, probably Zines will do good. Do good. If you're doing a crossover stent, especially across a big branch like circumflex or a large diagonal, you should have access to the branch. So choose one with open cells like a, uh, Onyx or Synergy. Uh, when, if you're putting a LMCA to LAD, sometimes there's a significant mismatch. You you, want, you have a five millimeter LAD and LMCA and 3.5 LAD or 3.5 circumflex. Your stent should be good, good to expand, expandable tree. That's the Onyx is one of the good vessels. Again, trackability, you should have ultra thin uh, struts. And if you've got instant restenosis, as far as possible, avoid a drug eluting stent. Always do OCT. Uh, results won't be good if you deal with instant restenosis without OCT. 
See what is the mechanism of instant stenosis? You use a cutting balloon or something rotablation and get away with the DCB. If you are desperate, use a the regulatory drug coordination of a different make, different poly, different uh, drug. And patients with STEMI may be DUS with biodegradable polymer, but this is uh, it's a debatable point. Uh, maybe if the presentation is delayed, if you have got a TMI zero flow, if a large thrombus burden is there, if you are not sure about the vessel size, if you are not using imaging, maybe you can do a plain balloon, established flow. If there is no dissection, come back and then go back and can put a stent little later. So we talk about all the time about the clinical evidence. We talk about evidence-based medicine, but in when it comes to stents, there are a lot of problems. If you look at the randomized control trials, most of the time, whenever you do a reason to read a randomized control trial, look at the inclusion exclusion criteria. You want to apply a RCT findings to your own patient. Ask yourself, will this patient be included in this study or not? So. The, most of the times, these uh, pivotal studies are done in low-risk patients. I'll tell you one more secret. Uh, I, I can take one minute. Uh, I was doing, um, uh, looking at the data of the driver stent. Uh, you may not, uh, probably is not available in the market now. Medtronic prepared, made the driver stent. It's a popular bi bare metal stent. If you look at the FDA data, the FDA data for bare metal stent of driver was 3 and 3.5 millimeters diameter and 16 millimeter length. With that, you, you get excellent results. If the lesion length increases, if the diameter of the stent decreases, you get worst results. So don't be, you know, don't be tempted to use long stents and uh, shorter diameters. So BMS uh, driver uses that data. With that data, they presented to the FDA and took uh, approval. But surprisingly, the BMS driver, the FDA data for driver for six months is 16% restenosis. When they did angiographic analysis of all the strands at nine months, the restenosis rate is 32%. It is there in the FDA website. If you are interested, you can go back and search that. So be careful when you are looking at these uh, RCTs. They use typically in a low risk patients and they exclude patients with uh, lower GFR, older elder patients, acute coronary syndromes, et cetera. And they never look at the superiority or equivalence. They look at the non-inferiority. So all strands look alike. And often compared with earlier generation DS or BMS, you saw the bioleader study. They, they compared with a uh, bare metal strand. It is not even available in the market now. And they use combined endpoints of tra target vessel revascularization, MI, stent thrombosis, cardiac death. They are all lower in number. So you, you will not get meaningful uh, additions not power enough to look at the late stent thrombosis. That's why I require meta-analysis. And more importantly, if you look at the giant's family of stents and again go to the FDA website, they don't do an RCT for all the iterations. The platform will remain same and some minor uh, tinkling, tickling will be there. You know, they, they change minor changes. And meta-analysis has inherent deficiencies. Thank you very much.